Sorry, the, there's been some discussion over the years, and I think there's some court cases about when is a regulation a taking of property in the sense that if you make a regulation that then renders a lot unbuildable, you've effectively taken that person's um, lot. And so I think that as this goes forward, I'm reading uh, 48, uh, 9, or 9B, I think, um, there's an awful lot of wiggling around in that particular section that I think sort of dances around the idea that it, there's two people in any of these uh, situations, two different, two individuals, two properties. We're not talking about uh, regulating what somebody does to one building on their property with relation to their to their house next to their barn but to the neighbor so just um and i think that even the city solicitor could probably probably remembers one of that because i think one of these cases was in amherst I want to encourage Robin, who is still with us, um, to to speak as well. Um, so I see she has her hand up. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I, I did hang. The discussions were actually pretty interesting. So thanks, especially about the charging stations. Um, so yeah, so I became interested in this because we have a one story house and there's a potential uh, and we have solar panels and there's a potential building lot next to us. And, you know, um, I, we did not do the calculations, you know, about what would happen, but it just got me thinking about this. And so I began to research it more. And we did, um, our access is, is somewhat blocked. It's not as good as it could be by two not very healthy pine trees that are at the base of that lot you know, very far away from where the house with that lot, it's a, it's a 0.86 acre lot with a house at the top of it. And these two unhealthy trees are in the back corner of that. And we offered to pay to take the trees down to gain, you know, access. Um, and we had them looked at and, and it was a no go. So the voluntary thing is kind of dicey, you know, on a, on a certain level, but, um, but, it, there is, you know, there's solar protection, which is in, in Boulder, they, you know, have solar fencing. So it's like, even if you never want to put solar in, there's a way, you know, so cities and towns have, have come up with various methods for um, approaching both either access or protection of existing solar um, and for businesses as well as for individuals. Um, Hartford has some legislation, some ordinances and, and around the country. And one of the things that I, um, I pointed to is that there is a, it, that it is a really complex issue. It is a really complex issue, but I really would hate to see us shy away from it because of that. And as I mentioned in my opening uh, public comments with, with the federal legislation that making uh, solar access more affordable and accessible to people um, of varying income levels, et cetera, that I think in the efforts of resiliency and sustainability, that it's worth the city looking into what is possible around this. And that the, I think that, that the San Francisco Department of Environment they did a really great national uh, comprehensive look at um, what cities and towns have done and the pros and cons to each one. So um, a city like Northampton can look at that and see, um, and you know, maybe some subcommittee on the NESC can look at that and begin to see what might work in, in a, in a place like Northampton, where yes, we need more housing, but yes, eventually climate resiliency is really important. And what does that mean for people who have invested and are going to invest in solar? So, because that's also a part of sustainability and resiliency. So anyway, that's what, um, so I'm really hoping that 
because it's complicated, we as a city will not shy away from it. And I think once you have the ordinance, um, I don't know that Amherst has that kind of an ordinance, so it makes sense that the lawsuit might go forward. But if once the bylaws and the ordinances are put into place, then um, you know the the fight is in the making the ordinance with the solicitor as opposed to post ordinance. I mean, just like we always are making ordinances and new bylaws, zoning bylaws. So. Thank you for your time. Thank you for raising this important issue. Yes, thanks, Robin. That was uh, very uh, thoughtful. Thank you. The accidental expert <laughs> you've become. In... I think Gordon has his things up. I don't know. Yeah, I um. I didn't mean I to be. To... <laughs> Sorry, oh, no, Chris. I didn't you. mean to take your role. No, no. Thank you. The um. The lag. I think that there. That is, this is a really interesting issue. I would be incredibly hesitant to uh, pass any ordinance that would forbid someone from growing a tree in their yard. Um, that seems like a heck of a reach uh, for one neighbor to say, hey, I've put solar in and therefore uh, you can't plant any trees in your yard. Uh, that that seems really a step too far to me. And I, I couldn't be a bigger supporter of producing power at the end user and storing power at the end user. I think it's absolutely critical that we move towards a system that does that. But I, I would be afraid of, of telling people we can't plant new trees for sure. I, I don't know if that's kind of a direction we're going. Oh, Robin? Or, or Marissa. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be brief. I, Gordon, I, I think that's that is a a good point. I guess I thought of it when so when we did a tour of the DPW, um, Rich Parsolitti talked. Actually, he mentioned one of the things he mentioned was that a lot of the solar companies take take back or you know trim back um, more than than is necessary um, for for optimal um, solar use. Um, and so I guess what I, I guess my my thought of that, my response to your comment, Gordon, is that is that and the points Robin raised in the in the issues behind this is that we need to be thinking about these things together. Um, I think I think better understanding of what what kind of 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 tree you know of what what is really needed for the best solar um, output versus um, so, so that that can be maintained for people who have made that investment, but also, like you said, Gordon, um, not restricting or doing more than we have to. I, I kind of think they go hand in hand. I think they have to be looked at together. Robin, and then Joyce. Oh, and then yeah. I mean, that's all. That's all I was really going to say is that, as I mentioned, it's complicated, and and that you have to consider both things and both. You know, there's the, I mean, the trees are important for the environment and solar access is important for the environment, you know, and, and so how you balance those. And also, you know, as every town and city does is that we have to balance the greater good and the individual, you know, kind of right. And that's always a complicated balance. Um, but it's, I, I, as I, I really, I just want to emphasize that I don't want us to shy away from this issue because of that. I think that there are some solutions to this to make it at least to move it forward and to think about it in a way that ultimately contributes to the sustainability and resiliency of Northampton and surrounding towns, because what happens to us happens to the next town, you know, where we don't live in isolation anymore, which is, again, the greater good and the individual, you know, so thank but, you. Yeah, if I may just really quickly, I, I, I think that there are certain types of trees that could be uh, uh, introduced, you know, we could really get into the nitty gritty of how this works by talking about the type of tree. If we are talking about evergreen trees, like those pine trees that will not give you 
any relief from the shade in the winter, uh, that's one thing. If, if it's deciduous trees, which uh, could really be necessary, say there's a low income family next door to Robin and they have no trees in their yard and they have no shelter from the sun. Right. If they were to plant a maple tree in that backyard that gave that family shade, I think we would all say that that's a good thing. And then it would lose its leaves in the winter and so that it wouldn't be shading the solar array in the winter when it wasn't needed to be providing shade for relief from the sun anyway. So if we're going to get really into the nitty gritty and make any rules here, we really need to get into the nitty gritty. And Joyce and Adele. Well, th this is very exciting um, because I hear that these are such opportunities for creative thinking and to already begin to hear the creative thinking is, is what an exciting opportunity. I've never been to one of these meetings and it's very exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Adele. Um, well, what this brings to mind is that um, there need to be considered height restrictions for both trees and dwellings, uh, buildings of any sort, next to a home that has um, solar panels. And I agree that it's very complex, but um, I would imagine that these other cities that have done this already uh, might have some guidance for Northampton. That's okay, it. I'm going to um, move us along because of time. But before we leave this topic, uh, Louis, go ahead. Nope, you're muted. I have, I have to leave, so I'll see you all next meeting. Okay, thank you, Louis. Um, Bye, Louis. So before we leave this topic, does the commission want to take it and, and identify a next step? Yeah, I, I, well, I was thinking about the next step because I see the issue because what Carolyn brought up is, you know, you have to make kind of obviously you make general rules and zoning. And what I my urge in, this, in a situation like this is to actually look, you know, look at each situation case by case and more holistically. And that's not really what municipal government is great at. So I'm just trying to think about I would I, I don't want it to die in the water and I would I would welcome next steps. Um, so if, if some, if, you know, I was thinking about engaging the planning board. I'm just not, I'm not clear. It, it seems to me that our municipal um, regulations aren't enough to prevent this, pro you know, this problem or potential problem. So I would, I would invite next steps, <laughs> anything that wouldn't uh, just let this not go anywhere. Does anyone have, um, you know, an idea about that? I mean, I could, I could, I could, you know, talk to the planning board or is it, Carolyn, do you think there's another, a better, uh, or, you know, we could even bring it up in like a council, you know, committee. Um, I have, think there's enough. I think there are enough weeds here that have <laughs> yeah, to right. be, um, that have to be sorted through before it goes to full council. Um, so I'm going to save you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that it makes sense to talk about the issues a little bit in more detail and you know, the issue, I think Robin raised that she went to her neighbor and asked them if they would take a pine tree down. So, you know, is it, if you, neighbors can't work it out, does that mean that the government has to come in and, and fix the problem for an individual? Or is this something global that we need to look at? Um, but I think it makes sense to sort of identify all those things and sure we could take another look at all the municipalities. I mean, there's some cities that have lots of sun like Boulder who have had this in place since the seventies. So it's definitely been around. Um, but, um, but I think it makes sense to sort of, if there's a sub, if there's a subgroup that wants to get their hands into this and I'd be happy to, bring sort of the land use regulatory perspective to that conversation. Um, but I think sort of, I almost see like a matrix that has to be identified of sort of all the goals and objectives on the one hand, and, you know, energy as well as housing and, you know, landscape and trees and all of that sort of has to be sort of put on the table and, and thoughtfully 
looked through and sort of the restrictions on how much can we really say height limits here, not over here, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, before it moves forward, I guess is what I'm saying. So to what to Chris's point, you know, are there people who, uh, who want to sort of delve into it more? Um, you know, and if so, um, I it would be happy to be part of that conversation. OK, well, I might leave it, but I, I I'm going to kind of think a little bit more about Northampton and maybe I'll just um, in, interact with you on, on it initially, Carolyn, just to see. Sure. Because there's, a, you know, as Robin pointed out, there's other options besides easements. And I'm curious if, is, if there is some way we can. I think there's a public interest here. I don't think it's just like two neighbors. I think there's a public interest in, in, in encouraging solar, but entries. Yep. So, so anyway, I guess what I'm saying is, um, I'm one, I, you know, I would love to find, you know, a way to bolster our, maybe our site plan review, something that, some way in which this is, you know, taken in consideration, um, even if we start looking at bigger issues, something more immediate. So let me give that some thought. And then that's something uh -huh. I can just talk to you about. If there's, yeah. And then, if, or in, of course, if anyone's interested in talking about this further with me or, uh, uh, you know, a subgroup, let, let me know. Yeah, I mean, we could talk. Um, I think that makes sense. I'd throw out one other thing that we might, um, I don't have the technical expertise on sort of evaluating um, appropriate solar angles. And and I know there's software out there that does it, but it, the other piece could be as part of application for panels on your roof, you know, maybe an evaluation of where the window is on the ground for that access so that we have more data about um, what might potentially be a factor in um, or impact solar access. So um, anyway, yeah, why don't we just start, you and I can sit down and sort yeah. of, and then maybe circle back and bring it to this group. Okay, sounds great. Thank you for your time, okay. everyone. Okay, um, last topic we're gonna get to, uh, Rachel, I'm actually gonna toss it back to you again. Uh, oh, the there you go. <laughs> point of city councilor report. I know, yeah, a lot going on today. Yes. So I, um, I'm i having some issues, so I don't have all my notes in front of me. But basically, I just, um, I have, we have our climate coalition here. And I think that they're ready to uh, give a synopsis on our um, June meeting that, that they organized that brought together municipal climate coordinators and climate directors. It was, uh, Chris was there. It was, quite dynamic and really informative um, and just really great to network with other municipal, you know, to see what other municipalities are doing. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, it's, you know, today has been a very decentering day. I'm having computer problems. There's locked up high school. I'm all, but I think, you know, I, I think in general, I'd like, you know, I, when I come to this or, you know, our commission, I really want to center on, on what we're doing here because, you know, we're, we are in a climate emergency and Gordon brings this up a lot. And, you know, this is a serious, you know, a, an emergency implies uh, immediate action, you know, immediate attention. And so my concern when I'm looking at, at, at our lovely city and how we conduct ourselves is the conducting business as usual, either on a personal level or on a municipal level is kind of how we got here in a climate crisis. And so I think we really need to, just approach uh, our thinking that something needs to change. I mean, that's the whole point of where we are: is that we cannot continue even conducting ourselves in way in a ways that were adaptive maybe 50 years ago or or so on. We're we're in a new situation. We know it's only going to get worse, um, unfortunately. And you know, it's 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 uh, tonight. I'm going after this. I'm going to Ag Commission to talk to farmers who are completely distressed because of the drought uh, they're having this year. And that's a very local issue. These are local Northampton um, farm farmers. So, um, you know, unfortunately, literally that this problem's heating up. So I don't, I don't have no doubt that we are gonna need a, you know, a, a climate emergency director of some sort for Northampton. Any resources we use for that person, I, I, I have full confidence would pay off in spades for our community. Uh, there's so, I think it's really um, a matter of figuring out how that will work. I think it's really too much to ask of our department heads to manage. We, we brought the, it's been brought up several times, even in this meeting. You know, it, 
the, the burden it, it puts on department heads uh, um, to, to have to coordinate this, you know, th these really kind of serious and dire uh, metrics and, and all that. So I think you'll find, um, I'll, I'll let the, the coalition give you a little synopsis, but I think, I, you know, I'm, I'm firmly in, on the side that we, we really need somebody to, to, court, to direct this, someone with, you know, accountability at, at a high level for the city of Northampton to bring all of our great efforts here and to make us, you know, to be the leader that we should be in our, you know, as the hub of our, our, our county. And I think we can really shine here. And I don't think the resource, the resources we did best would, you know, it's a lot of pull on resources in our city, but this is one I'm, I'm completely confident would pay off, uh, literally and figuratively. So let's, uh, let's see what the uh, coalition, um, I can't access the, um, the report or anything i'm having my own issues but I, I don't know if eric or yeah we have a whole okay great yeah. thank you yeah so thank you so much rachel that was great and i i want to say what an incredible support rachel has been and really everybody that we've talked to in the city has been really helpful and supportive uh by way of introduction i'm susan taberge and i'm part of the northampton climate emergency coalition i myself work with Climate Action Now, and we have folks from various organizations, residents in Northampton, who came together um, around this theme that's coming up over and over again tonight, is we need to rise to the moment that we're living in right now. And it means looking at everything we're doing through the lens of the climate emergency. And so um, the first thing that I would like to do is just have all the folks in our group uh, there's four of us tonight that have been working really closely together on this project of envisioning what it would look like to bring a climate emergency director to Northampton and, and how we, we can support the process of making it happen. So Joyce and Eric and Adele, if you just can give a wave so that everybody knows who's part of our, of our group. And um, what we would like to do tonight. We're really happy that you gave us time. And so we want to jump right in. Um, here's what's going to happen. We have condensed um, some of the main lessons from this very exciting meeting that, that came about this round table that Rachel was referring to with great conversation about how other cities and towns are grappling with this. And so we'll be sharing um, a condensed version of our slides. And uh, Joyce will be reading them and we're, we're reading, reading, taking us through it, reading us through it as we see the slides. And then we are going to um, just have some quick comments from the rest of us in the group, very quick. And then we want to move into, hopefully we'll have time. And if not, we'd love to have some next time because we're having, we planned on a bit more time, but we'd like to really welcome your ideas, your questions, concerns, thoughts, feelings. So I'd like to now pass things over. I believe that, I think that um, either Adele, Adele, are you I, sure? I have, the, I have the slides and if Chris gives me permission to share them, I will. Fantastic. And as Chris works on that, um, I wanna bring Joyce up here to the front of, the, of, our, Actually, of our virtual room. Yes. Do you have them up, Chris? Um, I don't have your slides. Okay. Uh, how do, wait oh. a minute, wait a minute. If you, if you just allow me to share my screen, I will put up the slides. I'm now trying to figure out how to do this. I thought you I could, to, it says share you, screen. I can, I can do it. Somebody um, a co-host. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah. Oops. Uh, by the way, commission members, I just want to say that this will be on the test, meaning I will <laughs> ask you uh, at some point, not today, I will, you know, probably ask for an endorsement from NESC. So just keep in mind that uh, we would love you to weigh in. Um, and also I'll, I'll be coming back with this too. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so let me just do this. I had to, okay, there we go. You should be co-host now. Okay. Joyce and Adele, you're on. I'm trying to find the slides, but Joyce, you just go right ahead. Okay. Um, okay. 
So as you have heard, we're a group of, we represent a group of concerned residents, part of the Northampton Climate Emergency Coalition. Um, and uh, we are exploring the creation of a position uh, for a climate crisis director. Next slide. I'm trying to figure out how to how to advance to the next slide. Sorry. You can just click on the left and it will go, but until you find out how to get it into presentation mode. Just click on the number three. Right. How, or, do, how, I, how do I, I get on presentation mode? Adele, you can go to slideshow yeah, sure. and I then did. go play. Play from start or play from current slide over on the left. See the oh, little there it is. Yes. Thank there. you. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Okay, there. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so there we go. And then, oh, there we go. So meeting the moment. And um, this is what I've already read. So we're ready for the next one. Bless our technical hearts. <laughs> um, these are the highlights from uh, our executive summary um, that we thought were important. Uh, the climate director uh, or climate, I'm calling it the climate crisis director, would be the one person in government with the responsibility um, to, uh, could you go back, Adele? Yeah, I'm trying. I'm sorry. I'm having, I'm having this, I'm having trouble figuring out how to go back. And I- You can hit I, escape and then start, yeah. start from a slide again. To be able to hit arrows. Listen. I wonder if we, if, um, well, here it is. Okay. Okay. Play from current slide. Okay. Uh, but, sorry, you got to go back a couple and select the one on the left. Okay, good. Beautiful. Okay. So this came up tonight that this uh, person who would be the climate crisis director, he would consider the implications of, um, the climate crisis on uh, all policies and practices. We talked about this tonight uh, and would work with all city departments to identify and implement urgent and necessary measures. Um, I think that would address some of the things that we talked about here. So now the next one, Adele. Uh, the person uh, in this position we feel and what we from what we learned from our panel is that it's important that this person report directly to the mayor um, uh, or the, the chief executive in some cases, but in our case, the mayor. Um, we feel that uh, that job, uh, that a job title um, would signal the importance of uh, the position and its interdepartmental role, uh, if it were coming in from the executive uh, branch. And uh, this person would participate with the, oh. Sorry, sorry. I'm trying. Oh my gosh. I think you can just use your arrow keys though. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. Thank you. I'm... Go ahead, Joyce. Um, the person would uh, must must participate in all the department director meetings and coordinate the relevant. Uh... I found this on the web. Oh dear! <laughs> <laughs> technology everywhere. That's our technical hearts. Revenge of technology on humans. Yeah. <laughs> our overlords. <laughs> to make an important point. <laughs> so anyway, oh, we feel that this person must participate in departmental director meetings and coordinate, be the coordinator, uh, the puller together of the threads of all the relevant municipal efforts. Next slide. This person should be in, uh, oops. I, 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 oh, I know why. Oh, I'm so sorry. God, I, I'm, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> and my dears, I have to leave in two minutes. No. 
it's going to be six o'clock. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up for you if you have to drop off. Perfect. But I hope you don't. <laughs> so is this the next one, Adele? Yes. So um, this person would be instrumental in developing uh, the metrics to regularly assess progress um, of our climate goals and evaluate uh, the climate uh, direction um, across all the departments. And the uh, person would also establish measurable goals for uh, our climate resilience and regeneration plan. This is another thing that the panel um, couldn't stress enough, and that is that public support is key. Um, and so this person um, would actively engage with local advocates who support the efforts and galvanize action and foster creativity and public uh, accountability. Um, someone to excite the public to join us and feel this urgency and do the work with us. Um, and that this person would be instrumental in building relationships in the community. This also was very important uh, involvement early in the municipal budget cycle. Um, the panelists found this necessary so that there would be the funding and uh, and this is something that takes uh, some creativity and some research to uh, find the funding. Um, so next slide, please. You got it. Okay. Um, so another, Thing that we talked about were the, the bigger challenge, a bigger challenge um, that, re, that this is this is resources beyond the city government's capacity would be necessary. So therefore, grant seeking and management um, uh, to and to use federal and state funds um, to give this what would eventually be the department. Uh, I think, um, some foundation. Oops. That's it. That's all the slides we have. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. And, um, and I'm going to skip out now. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you, so Thank you Joyce. Joyce. We'll talk to you soon. Be Thank well. You. And so um, we... Um, we want to hear a couple of things. Um, Eric, you have something that you want to yes. share? I, thank you. I just want to, I know we're late. I just wanted to mention money. Mm -hmm. Money, money, money. Um, <laughs> first of all, as has been mentioned, there will be more grants and funding from the state and, and federal levels. I just was in a presentation, a webinar about the fact that the IRA is going to propose is increase is extending the ITC and municipalities may be able to take advantage of it, the investment tax credit. It's extended for 10 years and there are there are ways to get more than 30%. Uh, so we the opportunities are are pretty big for us in in the coming time frame to to coordinate grants and to you know, to seek them and 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 make them work across all the all the departments and the and the residential sector. Secondly, nobody ever really thinks about. I shouldn't say that. This group probably does, and but the public doesn't think about, and maybe a lot of politicians don't think about the avoided costs. You know, an example is Jackson, Mississippi. There should have been state dollars that would have helped that community avoid what is the recent flooding and the shutdown. Uh, and that's the cost has to be 10 to one of what could have been avoided. Um, so we believe that at, over time that revenues will feed back from, from saved, dollar, saved money. And so we can think about this position as something that will enable that even more. Thanks. 
basically climate disaster costs more than this position. Thank you, Eric. And Adele? Um, I, I would just like to emphasize the, the issue of metrics. And, um, you know, we, we, we briefly alluded to that, but um, uh, the kinds of metrics, and it's not necessarily greenhouse gas reduction measures that we're talking about. We could be talking about the number of building owners who participate in energy efficiency measures, et cetera. So, um, so I, I really think it's a crying need for us to develop some metrics to assess our, regularly assess our progress. Thanks. Okay. And the last thing we wanted to share is we want to let you know what we've done so far and where we're headed with this. And step one was really trying to have this round table and learn everything we could from people who were doing the work. And we have since then been meeting with a number of people at the city level. We've been talking with Rachel actually, even before the round table about this, but once um, we, we, we finished that report, we met with Chris we also have regular conversations with people in our group. And that was really, really helpful. And Carolyn um, as well. And then we've had two meetings with the mayor and Alan was there as well. And we just had one this very morning and it was very productive. And we left feeling really, you know, like we're really trying to support each other here and get this going and feeling very hopeful. And, um, we are also in the process of meeting with city councilors. We're, we're trying to have a, at least two of us meet individually with each of the city councilors. I think we've met with about three folks so far. So we are really trying to um, hear from people. We also gave a presentation to Climate Action Now and we had folks from other cities and towns in our breakout group to talk about this. And so we were able to hear a little bit about what's happening in other cities and towns. So it's been all about a rich conversation. And now we would love in our remaining moments, if there are any, to hear any <laughs> comments and questions and ideas and thoughts from the group and hope we can continue this next time since um, I really wanna hear what everybody's thinking and feeling, we all do. So, um, Rachel, do you want to call on people since you're oh. official? What, oh, I what? said, or Chris, I mean, Chris can do it too. I just, yeah, I was just going to say, I, it really is important to hear from, especially department heads as well, because, yeah. um, because I'd be curious how, you know, you all feel about, since it would directly affect your work. Um, I, I would just really quickly ask commissioners, you know, it's, it's six o'clock. Are you willing to stay for a few more minutes? Yep. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> oh, uh, I guess I'll take that. Uh, I was just going to say that I would support whoever uh, gets put in this position, uh, that there would be a budget for them to have an assistant, mm -hmm. that there's too much work there for one person. Uh, you can't possibly expect someone to be tracking down grant opportunities and meet going to all the department head meetings at the same time. It's going to be too much. They're going to need an assistant. And to everyone else's point, that would also easily pay for itself in savings, in averted disasters, uh, and in grant funds over time. Uh, I don't think that one person could do it. It's great if we want to start with one person, but we should be careful not to bog that person down uh, to make it so that they can't actually accomplish anything because the amount of paperwork that they're doing. Um, I, so Rachel asked for department heads to sort of speak to this. I know that, um, you know, I um, was able to meet with um, this group uh, and I think, you know, we had a good conversation. Um, and I relayed that I, I don't know that the position necessarily has to be in the mayor's office. There are trade offs for having a mayoral appointed position versus a department position. I also don't think we have the capacity, nor is it necessary to create a separate department. I mean, one of the reasons why we sort of became the Office of Planning and Sustainability is to sort of to take on that role because there's a lot of um, 
I mean, planning has, uh, um, it, you know, involves, a, there's a lot of overlap there and, and we've, planning has always been a practice in which um, the lens of sustainability is always there. I think we just wanted to elevate that. So I think that, um, you know, there are budgetary constraints and yes, um, certainly um, utilizing grant funds um, to accomplish and implement the plan that's been adopted um, makes sense and we don't have the current capacity to have someone just focusing on on um, grants but I think that there are any number of ways where you could have someone who's focused on sort of plan implementation across departments and they could be located in a couple of different you know capacities um, so I guess I would just leave it at that. I think there are, um, I think really the, I, I find that the biggest issue really is um, that um, going after those grant resources. Um, you know, Chris and I have been in this conversation over the last couple of weeks about trying to go after uh, what would be a really exciting um, opportunity for the city, but it's hard to pull it all together. So. Um, and I don't, I would say, you know, I'll let central services speak for themselves, but I think that, you know, as departments were for the most part, you know, DPW and our department and central services and, you know, we're all in on, on um, trying to move the city forward and um, we need to bring all the departments in, but um, anyway. Yeah. So Thank you feel you. there's a need, you know, but it wouldn't just step on your toes. You feel like it would be helpful and, and fill a need. That's what you're saying. Oh, yeah. Well. yeah. 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 Okay. Good. And Thanks. I agree as director of central services that, um, yeah, I think there needs to be a central person that uh, I could bring questions to that would be helpful. Uh, and I don't know from my perspective, um, I'd love to have a mechanical engineer <laughs> on staff. Mm. You know, we have a, a, a big chiller uh, at the Forbes Library that we're going to submit an application for. But uh, in many ways, at this stage in September, we're looking to do this next summer. And the existing chiller is integral to the entire library. And to simply replace, uh, you know, uh, with the exact equipment would be the easy way. Uh, however, you know, I'm, you know, thinking about how to do this with uh, net carbon um, mm. consideration, and it's very complicated. I mean, I, I, I mean, Chris and I were talking about this. Like, how would we? possibly submit this i've already worked i have a mechanical engineer who is basically telling me you know it's going to cost maybe about two hundred thousand to replace it and that's a probably a lowball figure as is mm -hmm. and if we move forward uh you know with that we still have to consider the um carbon mm -hmm. uh, implications Right. And if we do that, we'd also need another mechanical engineer to look at this from another perspective to possibly maybe not replace a chiller, but um, replace it with a heat pump that could actually supplement the heating during the winter. Uh, but that in itself affects every, affects every single coil in that building because, you know, a heat pump the water temperature would operate at a much lower temperature, which means that all the coils would have to be bigger. <laughs> so, so if I submit an application, I, I need to almost have two applications. One is for consideration of replacing in kind what exists, but another one would be a, a very hefty budget on hiring engineers to figure out how to retrofit a, you know, a, a heat pump type device in there while making modifications to the entire building, all the different air handlers and such. So uh, from my mind, I tend to over simplify. I just think I need a mechanical engineer. <laughs> that's what I need. But uh, definitely, um, I'm sure that's not true. So I, I, I think that 
<laughs> you know, some central figure that could direct me in the right, you know, answer my questions, my my practical questions that I don't have answers to right now. And I kind of have to make it up as I go along. And Ben, I would love to hear from you. <laughs> You're muted. Sorry, I'm just, just hearing you bring up kind of uh, my bread and butter here. And I think in a sense, you're making it more complicated. I mean, in the details, it's gonna be complicated, but that's probably not gonna be something your in-house mechanical engineer would do anyway. What you need, I think, and this seems like the sort of thing that this uh, centralized kind of person who's, whose brain does accounting in carbon uh, instead of other things, right? That's kind of what this, this person's job would be. You know, the, the key thing is, okay, well, what are the big carbon impacts from the, the library? Well, the ones that you can't get rid of are the times when you combust a fuel instead of use electricity is if you're electrifying heating, right? That's, which is the point of going to a heat pump. But you don't actually have to change every single coil in order to, uh, to supply the heat from that heat pump. There are a bunch of other... Um, but it just means that you're not going to get 100% of the hours, right? So there are going to be many hours when you still have to run your boiler, but far, far fewer of them. And it's just about implementing the right temperature curve. Um, so in a sense, what you need is somebody who says, let's, you know, let's focus on the things that matter. Let us not ever buy another chiller that doesn't also take care of some portion of the heating demand. You know, because the, the big cost is just the replacement and installation cost, right? The, the, the difference between a heat, a, a reversible chiller and just a chiller is not that large, you know, compared to the, the replacement cost that you face with either one of them, you know, if you're not considering the alternative. So in a sense, like I said, you don't really need the mechanical engineer all you need is the basic principles. And then of course you're gonna hire a mechanical engineer to, uh, you know, to design the actual system. Mm -hmm. But if, if I can interject, I guess my point is, is that as a director with all the things I need to do on a daily basis, just doing general housekeeping for the department, yeah. uh, I have a hard time under, you know, coming to grips with what kind of budget number I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And I have like a month to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know that you do this every day, so you're certainly a good resource. Um, so, yeah, this is the know, kind I of just... thing that I, I'd love to be able to help out with. And yeah. that's, that's another way to kind of use NASC, I suppose, or use the university, however you want to choose to, to think of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, you know, but again, the key thing is that when you're coming up with a set of decisions that have to do with all the buildings you're managing mm -hmm. to have somebody whose eye is on, is this an opportunity we're missing? Mm -hmm. And if I could just add that part of this role is to find resources. And right now we have new federal legislation, a new state climate law. It's all pretty mysterious right now what's going on, but this person would need to be really up on available resources. So there might be help for a significant um, act in a city of, of changing fossil fuel infrastructure. So there's, there's a lot this person can do in helping us discover opportunities, but money sources and tapping into the community. Ben's a great example of people with expertise who are enthusiastic about sharing their skills and talents. So I think you're giving such a great example of um, how this position might be helpful. And yeah, I would just second what Susan, yeah. Susan just said. Um, you know, that, that was a perfect example of how a coordinator could bring together the resources that we already have when Patrick has a question like that. And it's really a big deal of looking at a, a big system like that and needing to replace it. And we have such a great resource as Ben uh, that's, that's here, but maybe uh, Patrick didn't think of calling Ben about this. And maybe that climate resource director would uh, that would be their job is to put, you know, put these dots together. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't want to go down in a rabbit hole, but I'll mention that that I've talked to the climate, uh, I've talked to the cost estimator that is working on the LEEDS project, and they think they could give us some guidance, um, comparative costs between different things. So good. That's the kind of resource that we're, I think you're talking about. Finding good. Something like that. Uh, just to, to end what I was saying, I, I agree. I think it's a good idea. Thank okay. you for your real world example. That's exactly what I was you know, thinking about and wondering about. Yeah. Yeah, Pat's right. It's very complicated. When you when you get add in timing and when, yep. Yeah. Like so we are at yeah. six six eighteen. I think is can I mean do we need to have this conversation continue next time, or are people willing to continue going? I, I have I to go. To, I need to. I have to go too. Right. Yeah. How about we continue? And if this this was recorded, so hopefully the folks who had to leave earlier weren't here could see this section and be prepared, or we could talk with one of them. Oh. Yes, yeah. okay. it, it is being recorded. By the way, a good part of the meeting was not recorded. <laughs> saw that little recording thing go on, like, but oh, I think we started, so thank you. Right. Um, okay. Um, I think we're going to call it a wrap then. Great. See you all soon. Right. Thank you, everybody, for staying. I really appreciate it. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.